in recent lessons, we have been talking about the Bible. Is it believable? Is it true? Can we understand it? We've talked a little bit about whether it is applicable to us in our age today, in our culture, and the way things are today. In today's lesson, I want to show a sermon that I preached some time uh, ago concerning that very question. Is the Bible applicable for today? We'll do part one of this sermon this week and then part two in next week's lesson. I appreciate your attention. appreciate your feedback all these weeks and I uh, hope you enjoy this lesson and get something out of it. May God bless you. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. Those words of Acts 15, 40 and 41 are only one of several records of the work of the apostles of Jesus who planted churches, then revisited those Christians to support and increase their growing faith. The word translated confirming means establishing besides, strengthening more rendering more firm. The record continues in Acts 16.4 to show what they did and what resulted. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. This Confirming the Church's Bible class focuses on those decrees of the apostles that will help us to grow stronger in faith and service if we learn and apply them. Luke chapter number 10, verse number 26. What is written in the law? How do you read it? In answer to a spiritual question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The Lord Jesus gave a direct answer, directing the man to the written word of God. We don't have to go too far from this building this morning to find all kinds of different answers. I would s suppose that within the city limits, we could probably find at least a half a dozen different answers in church buildings. To, the, to that question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus knows. It was through him that the Holy Father created this world. He was with the Father. He was God in the beginning, John chapter 1. He knows what heaven is and what is required. I want to point out just something here about the Bible and how do you read before we get too far into our lesson. <clears throat> we sometimes hear discussion, and I believe some of us were in a discussion recently about how do you distinguish between, what, what is this explicit statement, implicit statement? And how can you tell whether something is implied in the scriptures? Well, let's just look at this passage in front of us. What is written in the law? The question implies that it's necessary to know the law, to know what's written there. And then Jesus says, and how do you read it? And so it's, the, the implication is here that it's necessary to read it correctly. It's necessary not only to read the word correctly, but to apply it and do it. What must I do that I, must, that I may inherit eternal life? Well, what's written in the Bible? So, read it, read it correctly, and then do it. All of that is implied by the question and the answer. And so when we read the Bible, if we think about what we're reading and apply it to ourselves... We are handling the word the way that God intended that we should. The Bible authorizes us by what it says, not by what it doesn't say. But it says both explicitly and implicitly. Jesus simply said, what's written in the Bible? The implication was, you ought to know that. You're a ruler in Israel, you ought to know what's written in the Bible. 
And so the Bible implies, it says by implication, that the man needed to know <clears throat> what's written in the book, and so do we. We don't need to have a thou shalt not in order to know what, that a thing is forbidden. If God says, do it this way, then that's when we do it. If God says, eat the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, then that's the time we eat the Lord's Supper. We don't have to say, don't do it on Monday, don't do it on Friday. He says, do it here, do it this way. So that's how God authorizes what we need to know. So God tells us what is permitted by direct statement and by implication. And so what's not stated and what's not implied is therefore not authorized and not permitted. It's really that simple to understanding the Bible. At least the basics of how to begin to use the Bible. Now the question before us today is not whether the Bible makes certain statements by uh, impl implication or by direct statements, whether the Bible says something. The question is whether it means that today. Is there a Bible for today? Do these statements and implications apply to us today? There is a growing phenomenon in the Lord's church today that much of what's written in the Bible, in fact, most of what's written in the Bible, was only a local situation. That was just for those people to whom that letter was initially addressed. And maybe even then only for a short period of time. It was local, it was temporary, and it's not for us today. But if we can read and rightly handle the Word of God, then we can weigh the, the validity of that philosophy, of that kind of a statement. What does the Bible say? God says in the pages of the Bible, that God's word is going to stand forever. The fear of the Lord is clean and enduring forever, Psalm 19 and verse number 9. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. Psalm 119, verse 144. And if you don't know the 119th Psalm, the longest chapter in the Bible, you really need to spend some time reading it. And then go back and read it again. And every time you read it, I think you're going to be more and more awed at the source, the power, the impact, the practicality of the Word of God, the Bible itself, in your own life. Verse 144 in Psalm 119, The righteousness of thy testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding and I shall live. Verse 152, concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. And verse 160, the word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. God's word wasn't going to change. But somebody will say, well, that's, that's Old Testament. And you know, as we go through the Old Testament, some people look at this forever, and those who uh, really uh, are Zionists today, they'll see where God says, I'll put my name in Jerusalem forever. You'll be on this land forever. We've got to put Israel back on their land. We've got to protect them in the Holy Land. And yet, you read through those passages, and over and over and over again, God says, forever until, <laughs> or forever throughout your generations. And that forever ended when their generations ended at the cross and the Lord gave us something new. But that's a deep, deep discussion for another time. The Old Testament wasn't intended to be a law forever. Still here, we still read it, we still benefit greatly from knowing it. It's important to us. 
There's much of the Word of God applicable to us today in the Old Testament that isn't in the New Testament. And so we need the whole Bible. But look at what God says in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 24, verse number 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, Jesus said, but my words shall not pass away. You know, some of what Jesus said was, do this, don't do that. Worship God. Keep my commandments. Those things don't pass away. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, that we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abounds forever. And in verse 25, two verses later, the word of the Lord endures forever, and this is the word by which the gospel is preached to you. Peter says that we were born again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. That is, the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. Over in John chapter 3 and verse number 5, Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus said, huh? And Jesus said, you've got to be born of the water and of the Spirit. And that's not two separate births as some people try to teach. Born once of water and Spirit. You're already born. Jesus wasn't stupid when he was talking to Nicodemus. He knew he'd been born. He wasn't telling him to be born physically. But he had to be born of the water and of the Spirit. The Spirit of God, which teaches the Word of God, which gives us the Word of God and teaches us how to be born into Christ. And then the water into which we are buried with Christ, into His death, where His blood was shed, so that from that burial, like Jesus rose, we too can rise to walk a new life. He lived, He died, His life was over, but He got a new life. He walked around again and He touched me. He said, come and touch me and see, it's me. We're not going to get that, but we have a new life. Someone wrote a book about new Christians. And he said, it's not the same old me. Well, I, you know, physically here I am and I look the same and I still got the same two funny ears and big eyes and big nose and, you know, all of that. But I'm different inside. I've got a new life now in Jesus Christ. I've been born again. Born anew. Not of corruptible seed, but of an incorruptible seed. That is the Word of God that lives and abides forever. But our point here is that we are looking at a Bible, dealing with words that are going to last forever. They're not going to go away. They're not going to be replaced. God requires every generation to look back at the ancient word to keep the word that he already has given once. In Numbers chapter 5, even in the days of Moses, God's word was, These things shall be for a statute of judgment unto you throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Now when that law was given, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, God, Moses said, now, you know, we God, God's given us something here that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob never had. Adam and Noah and Job never had. We've got something new and special. God came down on Mount Sinai and gave us His law. We got a written book from God. Something new started there. But still we're told to remember <coughs> Abraham, a friend of God, Remember Adam and the fellowship that he had with God in the garden? Remember how he violated that blessing from God by disobeying God's instructions? Remember all of that. But now Moses says, here's a written word. And it's for you to keep throughout your generations. And there's that expression again. But look at this. 
In that first generation after Moses, God said to Joshua, be strong, very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which my servant Moses commanded you. Don't turn from it to the right hand or the left, so you can prosper in it wherever you go. Now Moses is dead. A new generation is here. Never mind that. Keep the law. The word is still valid and required. Vainly we seek after men for guiding light. Or in dreams for a heavenly call. Man of himself cannot set his soul aright. So it's back to the Bible for it all. Back to the Bible, the God-given Bible. For grace and duty, great or small. Each one may know what to do and where we go, but it's back to the Bible for it all.